Welcome, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Dan Rowe. As a staff member at the Mayo Clinic for 38 years and um, provider of psychological care to people with spinal cord injury, his clinical knowledge and wisdom is immense. He's published widely and has led the professionalization of the field of rehabilitation psychology as a founding board member and past president. I've had the um, opportunity and the privilege to talk with Dan about his keynote and he shaped my professional practice and I hope this will be your experience through listening today and through participation in the group and um, the group discussion later on as to how we apply these very pivotal I think principles to our practice as clinicians. Thank you Dan. Thank you Tim. It's so wonderful to be here and I, it's a privilege and an honor to be able to be with you. Um, I have 70 slides, and it's, and it's after lunch, and what fool would have 70 slides and have the aspiration? So we're going to go th through things quickly. The idea is that I might not read all these slides, but I wanted to get the information to you. So, um, uh, so we're going to um, do several uh, things today. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers of the conference, partic particularly Jane and Jasmine, as well as, as, well as Daniel, Magnus, and Peter uh, for inviting me here. Um, had a great time with Anka at the Swiss Paraplegia Center yesterday, and, uh, and so thanks so much also to this wonderful university and using this facility. <clears throat> so the learning objectives that we're going to try, you can see there's an immense number, we're going to define the field of rehabilitation psychology. Many people know about rehabilitation in general, but particularly in Europe, you know of the concept, but there's actually a specific field in, re in psychology in the United States. So I'm going, I want to walk through the history of that field, and in the process of that, we'll talk about the development of the underlying um, value-laden beliefs and principles. And I'll talk about a bit about the founding of the uh, Division of Rehabilitation Psychology back in 1958, so it's over 60 years ago. I'll talk about the founding of the American Board of Rehabilitation Psychology, in which you can be board certified, just like you could in a medical specialty, you can be board certified in 15 different specialties in psychology. One of those is rehabilitation psychology. It has some very specific competencies that you have to demonstrate uh, as well as background to be boarded in rehabilitation psychology. We'll talk about the training council, the foundation, and then I want to spend, so I want to spend about 20 minutes doing that, and then I want to spend about 20 minutes talking about Beatrice Wright. She's really the grandmother of the field of rehabilitation psychology. She died last July at age 100. So I have some pictures of Beatrice, and she really is the person who's brought all these values together and really has in, in, informed what it means to be a rehabilitation psychologist. So she's the seminal person in the field. Then we want, I want to talk about the foundational principles, and these are the principles that unite what we all do when we work with persons with spinal cord injury. And so um, once I do that, we're going to then take a five-minute stretch break because this is going to be like a blitzkrieg to to get this all done, but we'll take a break, and then what we're going to do is have an interactive discussion about how well these foundational principles, we in rehabilitation psychology think that these are the core constructs that drive what makes unique what psychologists do in rehabilitation compared to any other field of applied psychology. So the question is whether it will be whether or not this is true for your European experience, your background and training, but also the society that you're in, whether or not these foundational principles should be amended or changed. They're meant to be dynamic. It's not the Ten Commandments. They're meant to be dynamic, but the question is, uh, we in the, in the field have kind of said, these are the core constructs, the six core. Do they really apply in other settings other than in the American experience with disability? So that's the overall goal. A little bit about where I'm from. So the Mayo Clinic is, I believe, the biggest healthcare clinic, single clinic in the United States. So I'm uh, in Rochester, Minnesota, and it gets a little bit cold up there. But there's two other Mayo Clinics. There's one 
we call that the mothership up in Rochester, and then we call those the satellites. And so all the second tier, no, uh, people go to, no, that, that's not true. But uh, Scottsdale and Jacksonville are great facilities in their own right. But there, so there's three different settings, but Rochester is really the home. This is the downtown campus. It's a city of 100,000 people. Uh, I think it's 35,000 are employed by the, by the Mayo Clinic. So it's really a medical mecca. And this is the downtown building, and 10 blocks away is St. Mary's Hospital, which is just to the west. And actually, um, let's see, I have a pointer. So, um, uh-oh, that was the wrong thing to do. So the pointer's in the center. On the front. So anyhow, <laughs> the parking garage west of that, there's three new stories that just were put onto that, and the new rehabilitation facility is those, those top three stories that you can't see. It was just, it's just in the process of being completed in a couple of weeks, um, and we'll be moving in so, soon. So this is Rochester in the springtime, and this is where I just came from. And quite literally, we had uh, 29 below uh, uh, Fahrenheit, and we had 60 below with wind chill just about a month ago. So it's been a tough winter, but it does get kind of cold. Looks like Siberia. Um, so the things we're going to do, to just reiterate, we're going to define rehabilitation psychology. We're going to talk about its origins. We're going to talk about its current status. Then we're going to shift over to Beatrice Wright and her role in developing evaluating beliefs. And then we're going to slide into the foundational principles. So I hope you find this informative and relevant to your own clinical experience. So rehabilitation psychology, this is the consensus definition that was or, uh, devised in 2016 in Denver, Colorado. The Division of Rehab Psychology came together and said that this is the specialty area within psychology, focuses on the study and application of psychological knowledge and skills on behalf of, of individuals with disabilities and chronic health conditions in order to maximize health and welfare, independence and choice, functional abilities, and social role participation across the lifespan. So it's not just acquired disability or developmental disability, it also can be chronic health conditions. It can be cancer, it can be rheumatoid arthritis, it can be other kinds of chronic health conditions, but the principles are the same. And so this is the, de the, de the current definition. And throughout, there'll be references at the end, you'll see occasional websites that you can go to to just you know, grab these definitions and these statements. So the, the origins of this really stem pretty much uh, around World War II, uh, a la uh, Sir Ludwig Gutmann and development of PM&R services in, in the States. And so in 1949, the Easter Seals put up money. Easter Seals is a, is a charity, and they sponsored the development of special interest group within the American Psychological Association focused on, in particular, working with veterans. So that was a, a big focus uh, around uh, the end of the war and during, And then, of course, Korean War came to the United States, and so we had a new set of, um, you know, it's a major war uh, for the United States and many, many uh, casualties. So, um, so that developed a special interest group of, of psychologists who then in 1953, uh, they started uh, as a special interest group, which is really the beginning of a division there's 55 divisions within the American Psychological Association. And so there was a bulletin put together in 1953, and, and uh, sure enough, Beatrice Wright was, she's a, a prolific writer, a very careful writer, and she was the, uh, the first editor. So she had a lot to do with the founding of that bulletin. And then in 1958, the APA designated Division 22 as a division. Uh, during that same year, the Princeton Conference was held and I could show you a lot of pictures, but this was 66 individuals in Princeton, New Jersey, and about half of them were applied psychologists working with persons, particularly in VA settings. The VA set the, the tenor for acceptance of applied psychology with individuals with disabilities. And so there about half were applied, but the other half were social psychologists. So the idea of direct care, clinical care, versus the larger social milieu of how, how that determines behavior you had two uh, very, very interesting groups to talk to each other. So very much rehabilitation psychology has been applied social psychology 
from the very get-go of the field, and these really brilliant people came together at this conference, but they couldn't agree on a definition, and so Beatrice said, well, I'll put it together, and so she wrote the principles and assumptions. There initially were 12, and, and gradually that came to 18 and to 20, and we've redistilled or distilled down to six, but it, we have a legacy straight from that Princeton conference in these foundational principles. So the journal was started in 72, the division was named uh, Rehabilitate Change to uh, Rehabilitation Psychology in 73. So um, the um, current mission of Rehabilitation Psychology, they have a new logo, they really tried to work with, uh, to, to make this a contemporary division. So a nice logo, you can see the mission is to lead the community of psychologists who through research, practice, education, advocacy, enhance the well-being of people living with disability or chronic conditions. There's about 1,100 members. It's been very stable in terms of its membership over the past 30, 40 years. Um, this strategic planning, you can see the new logo, but also I love the I love the byline, it's life fully realized. That kind of boils it down to what we're, trying, what we're all about in the field of rehabilitation psychology. So we sponsor a midwinter conference, which you all should think about coming to. It's, it's two and a half days, um, 25 continuing education credits that you can, and you'll have psychologists who think exactly like you, for good or for ill, but exactly like you uh, in terms of topics. And, uh, and the, it pu publishes a journal, and then you can see the website. So <clears throat> a separate organization, so that's the American Psychological Association. There's the American Board of Rehabilitation Psychology. We then, in 1995, founded this, and this is one of 16 specialties. I think I said 15, there's 16 specialties, and the umbrella board is called the American Board of Professional Psychology. So that's the overarching board. We're one member uh, organization to that board, so we have to meet their general criteria and then special criteria to, uh, to be boarded. To get boarded, you need a PhD from an APA accredited program, or it could be from Canada. We've never had anyone apply or consider applying from Europe, but I'm sure the board would consider how could we possibly make that happen. Um, and you can see what the criteria of uh, internship, three years experience, uh, currently, there's 200 board members that are certified. There's two in this room. I'm one. What's the other one? Oh, there she is, Denise. <laughs> so Denise is uh, another board certified uh, rehabilitation psychologist. So there's about 200. And you can see there's, there's the application, the website. The, um, and th these are the criteria. So the, the overarching board, the foundational competencies, you can see there's eight of them. And so these are general uh, competencies that have to be met for anybody who wants to be board certified. The specific or the functional competencies are those things that are unique. And in the, the case of, say, assessment, uh, if you go on the website, it's assessment of sexual health, it's uh, substance use assessment. So there's lots of assessments that you have to be able to be um, uh, competent in doing in order to pass your board. So it's very demanding, but very clear about what the competencies are for someone who would be board certified. Uh, at the present time, about 5% of PhD psychologists in the United States are board certified. But increasingly, it's become the criteria for you to get hospital privileges. And if you work for the Veterans Administration and you have this, you'll get a pay bump. So it's both, uh, there's some legal connections to it, there's some pay implications but there's also staff privileges. So increasingly, it's going to become the standard uh, is to adhere to this. The last organization, um, so I've previously been president of those two previous organizations. So what happens when you get as old as I am, then you're supposed to raise money to keep the field going. So we started the uh, Foundation for Rehabilitation Psychology uh, back in 2005, and you can see our goal is to advance the psychology of disability and chronic illness, um, or we should say chronic health conditions. So this is a tax deductible, it's a 501c3, and we've raised close to about $200,000 over the past 10 years, and we've given away 40 to $50,000 primarily 
and student awards in terms of graduate training. Uh, you know, you're trying to do your PhD, where do you get the money? So these are seed grants to try to have graduate students then be able to complete the research. And so um, we, have a, a, we also sponsor classic articles, Beatrice writes articles on the website, some classic articles, and we call it Foundations from the Foundation. And I'll show you some names of some classic articles that are located there because it's the history of the field of rehabilitation psychology. And one of the reasons that we do this is nobody knows their, you know, rehabilitation students today, they don't even know about these people. But this is the origin of where they got where they're at as a field. So we really want to promote that as a field. We also are promoting Dana Dunn's book, The Social Psychology of Disability. And this is uh, Beatrice Wright had two editions of her book. And I tried to get Beatrice to do a third edition with Dana Dunn as the co-author. And I had a yes from her, and then I got a no. This is, she's 85, and she said, Dan, my book's perfect. Why would you want to? <laughs> so who's, who's to argue with Beatrice? There's no way to argue with Beatrice. So Dana, who's a social psychologist, again, bringing back kind of full circle from the Princeton conference, is a social psychologist who has a unique specialty in the area of the, dis the psychology of disability, the social psychology of disability. And he's a, a teacher. Um, and he's also on the foundation board, and he's the incoming president of Division 22. So he doesn't specifically work clinically, but he understands the, the psychology of disability better than anybody. And this book is a tour de force. I recommend anyone here should read this book, and you'll say, oh, yeah, this makes perfect sense. And you'll see the history and w why people treat persons with disability as they do. And so we'll, we'll get into that, but this is like the, the Tour de Force book, and, and we're so helpful, uh, so um, happy that Dana took on this task. So um, there's also a training program, uh, Council of Training Programs, and so we had a Baltimore conf uh, conference that solidified these training competencies. And so there's 15 training programs currently in postdoctoral uh, rehabilitation psychology that are standardizing what are the skill sets and the competencies of somebody board certified in rehabilitation psychology. This is Dana. And I'm going to shift over at this point uh, and start talking about uh, the, con the um, <coughs> foundational principles a little bit. So he's a, uh, a PhD from, uh, from Vir uh, University of Virginia. And he's written over 30 books, 170 articles. He's been the president of two different divisions. And um, he really was the person who helped us distill down the, the value-laden beliefs along with a couple others in, uh, I had a, a little bit of a role. And so, uh, so, but he was really the person who said, th this is the essence. Um, so Dana is the, the great wordsmith person to do this. And uh, to talk about Beatrice, this is really, when you think about as a rehabilitation psychologist, what's the core of what, what, what you, what you're about in terms of helping people. And it's Beatrice's values. The Division 22 is very much focused on values. And so the essential core concept of human dignity is that a person is an object, not a thing. And so we were just talking about all the white coats out there and what kind of reaction, six white coats coming in if you're a patient laying there and what impact that would have as opposed to being sensitive to the environment. Uh, and so, but this is a core construct that pervades the foundational principles. And we always come back to this because I really do think it really is essential uh, to, to what we do. So that's from Beatrice Wright. So that's her. And um, did, did anybody know of Beatrice? There's uh, two or three hands in the room that you might have read some of her work. So it's, this is new information to people. So. Um, <clears throat> She, uh, I knew her fairly well from Division 22 over the course of about 15 to 20 years, but she was a compassionate researcher, practitioner, educator, and advocate. She attended Brooklyn College starting in 1933, and she studied with the premier social psychologists of the day, Solomon Ash, uh, Abr you know, Maslow from Hierarchy of Needs, uh, and Max Wertheimer. She went to the University of, of uh, Iowa in 1938, and she then studied with the preeminent social psychologist, I think, of all times, which is Kurt Lewin. And so uh, with his field theory, and this is really, again, where we, the biopsychosocial model was invented by Kurt Lewin. 
So everybody else gets credit for it. Kurt Lewin was the person who invented it. So very early on, she's studying with him. She also spent a year at Ohio State, my alma mater, or I should say the Ohio State University. It actually, it's kind of a joke, but it's, it, that's the real title, it's the Ohio State University. So she studied with Carl Rogers for a year, and she was very much a Rogerian, client-centered therapist. And so she never forgot those therapy aims. And very much rehab psychologists are very much client-centered. She moved to University of Kansas. There she actually helped Fritz Heider, again, preeminent social psychologist, help write The Psychology of Interpersonal Relations, a classic book. Eventually she retired to University of uh, Madison in Wisconsin. She was taught there for three years. And I was so close to Madison, I'm just a three-hour drive, so I, I, I drop in on her every one, once in a while. I think I met with her about four times in her apartment, and we had great conversations together. She taught me a lot. So um, the, uh, she was a fellow of APA, president of the division, and she, uh, in 2016, it's very difficult to, to get this award, but she got the gold medal award <clears throat> for life achievement in psychology and the public interest from APA. Um, these are some of her co-authors, so on those foundational principles um, is that uh, these are Tamara Dembo, Roger Barker, the whole construct or field of somatopsychology back in the late 40s and early 50s, but you can see uh, many, many others. Um, and these are the classic books, the two classic books, and both editions are listed by APA as the 100, 100 most influential books in psychology. So the first and the second edition. I was going to bring my first edition because the first edition is really what made me a rehab psychologist. And you'll see this quote from Paul Kennedy. In the early 80s, when I started working as a clinical psychologist, people with disabilities, I found rights writing helped me frame an understanding of, ex of the experience of disability that's helped me across many different settings. And so Paul and I had the same, uh, you read that book? Yeah, I read that book. And there are a couple of other people that you read the book. It was like reading a book that it just it sent off light bulbs in your head, it all started to make sense in terms of what you're doing and why you're doing and how you might go about doing it. So I really recommend for sure Dana's book, but go back to the originals and they're just amazing book. Beatrice was, uh, uh, it was fun to have this conversation with Paul. I said, you too? Oh yeah, me too. So it was really, really a uh, fun experience. These are some of what we call writing in principles, a person first emphasis and that you avoid objectification of a person. You always are talking about a person with a disability, not the disabled. The second is the dignity and rights, that first quote that I talked about, the idea that it's, it's client-centered, that rehabilitation is therapeutic process that involves the client at the heart of it, and it's always to focus on assets. So you always want to be focusing on what's constructive, what's positive. So, Division 22, rehabilitation psychology, all that presages, po the whole positive psychology movement was right there from the very get-go in, in terms of, and there's much in common with, uh, with rehabilitation psychology and the whole positive psychology movement. So you guys have invented it. It's old stuff to us. Every, the rest of the world's coming to us because they're saying, yeah, we should really fo focus on assets. We probably shouldn't focus on the bad stuff. Yeah, that's good. So... Um, so she started by, as I said, in 1958, the, uh, the uh, Princeton Conference, and so she initially summarized these 12 value-laden beliefs and published this, Psychology and Rehabilitation. And then um, this expanded, she kept thinking, and this expanded uh, to 18 beliefs, and then that evolved to 20 beliefs in the second edition of Physical Disability. And the foundational principles the idea of a foundational principle, it's a basic essential concept drawn from Wright and other founders that guide the theory practice and research in rehabilitation psychology. And so they really, it really focuses on the human, humanistic side of science and emphasizes the experience and well-being of a person with a disability matters above all else. Uh, very different than other parts. So, and again, the, the reason now is that as a foundation, we really want to promote these principles because people just don't understand their heritage and they're so easy to port and to explain to people. So it's very vital to maintain the, the zest and, the, and the, 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 uh, the contemporary relevance of these foundational principles. Um, and the point is that they're meant to be dynamic. So it could be that they'll change with time, 
but they also seem to be timeless. And one of the reasons to have the conversation after this presentation to say, does this really fit, these foundational principles really fit? But they also make explicit, um, uh, some things that are, uh, make implicit beliefs in our practice more explicit. So the six are as follows. The first focus is on the person environment relationship. The second is the insider outsider distinction. The uh, third is uh, focuses on, on adjustment to disability. And again, uh, the fourth is focusing on psychosocial assets. Um, fifth is the self-perception of bodily states. This rates, relates a lot. We were talking about attribution theory. We're talking a lot about coping framework. And this directly goes to this issue that how you think is how you perceive. And you, that's something that you can help people with. And then going back to that first principle of human dignity above all else. So the person environment relationship. So Kurt Lewin uh, was, the, uh, was a mathematician. And uh, he came from before World War II. He left Europe and came to the States. And he really is one of the most influential founders of social psychology as well as rehabilitation psychology. Um, funny story about, so Beatrice would talk about, it would be a cold Iowa morning there in Iowa City, and she would get in the car because he'd pick her up to take her to, to school. She was on the way. He was, she was his graduate student. And it'd be frosted on the inside. You can imagine it's like 1940 and it's how good the heaters are. And it's frosted on the inside. And Kurt Lewin was always into thinking about something else. He wasn't, she said he was a terrible driver. And so he'd be driving and get into it, and he'd start drawing Venn diagrams on the frost. And she said it, she was scared to death, you know, because he's driving, and he's in this. And I can just imagine, she said, it was amazing. But, um, but Lewin said there's nothing more practical than a good theory. And so um, his, uh, his, the, the, the person-environment relationship it, it relates to that there's multiple influences going on uh, that, that in a social setting that often override personal factors and how people perceive their situation affects subjective experience and behavior. And it's the interaction between the person and the environment that really determines behavior. So behavior is a function of the person and the environment. Later, Roberta Trishman added an O in there for organism. So you have to take into account the physiological status of the, of the person. That also determines behavior. But the issue is that if you're, uh, I'm trained as an individual differences psychologist. I do a lot of measurement and focus on personality characteristics or um, um, person, uh, personality, um, values, needs, intellectual ability. Those are all within the person. And the issue is no matter how well you manage traits, the behavior that comes out is dependent upon the interface between the person and the environment. And in many cases, the environment can override the characteristics. When you think about mod behavior, group behavior that overrides the characteristics. And that's what Lewin is talking about here and how it relates to uh, potentially to disability. So example is a person with a disability encounters um, social barrier. The social barrier could be ignorance, prejudice, discrimination, not due to them, not due to their disability. So the attitude, this is a social construct. Attitudes of strangers based on stigmatized, stigmatized beliefs and stereotypes are the source of the problem. So rehabilitation psychologists are advocates. We want to change and not just talk to the person in the office, but we want to affect larger social changes from social barriers to physical barriers. Um, so the, um, the uh, um, let's see here. So the power of the situation, did I skip one? Okay. I'm going, to, I'm going to link, I'm going to jump over. So uh, the example, another example that you've seen, uh, an observer sees somebody in a wheelchair who's having difficulty entering a building, and instead of attributing the difficulty to uh, a, a lack of a ramp, some sort of physical barrier, they focus on the person. They don't focus on the environment. And so um, then, they, then they start thinking about, um, uh, the, you know, the power of the situation is then neglected because the person with the disability engulfs the field. And, the, and this block behavior is attributed to the disability and perhaps they're helpless, they're dependent. So they wind up having negative attributions made to them when none are warranted. What's warranted is the environment is the problem. Um, so that's, that's the, the first issue. The second issue is the insider. Anybody here of the insider-outsider distinction? 
kind of a, a couple persons know the construct. So the insider-outsider distinction comes really, uh, Tamara Dembo is uh, associated with this. Tomorrow I met her, and she's like four foot 10 when I met her, I don't know, 30 years ago. Powerful mind, little woman. And so, uh, but she, she wrote on this in classic paper, the role of the outsider is that of an observer, and the role of the insider is that of a participant. Uh, because the observer is an, is an outsider, the impact of the situation affects him little. And so they just don't take into account what's going on in the situation. They focus on, on, the, on the person rather than from an insider's perspective. So insiders are people with disabilities, either congenital or acquired, who know the experience of disability because they live it. <clears throat> Whereas an outsider is an observer who imagines what life with a display might be like and typically, if they're temporarily able-bodied, um, like many of us are, that's presumptively negative. So, so insiders generally see their situation as more favorable. They have a different view of disability than outsiders. And, uh, and insiders' perspectives that should inform, this is part of participant action research, is part of always in, trying to include persons with disabilities on your research teams, on your intervention teams, to say what's their perspective. So uh, outsiders and people often equate disability with illness or inability to accomplish. They assume disabilities, uh, per disabled persons are preoccupied with their physical state. They imagine that uh, what a disability is necessarily like and they project their values onto the person with disability. And they often are well-intentioned uh, acquaintances, uh, strangers, family care providers, including professionals. And that's one of the big problems when somebody's not trained as a rehabilitation psychologist and they don't understand this perspective, and you've seen it time and time again, where somebody, a new trainee comes in and goes, oh, that poor person I saw today. And it's like, um, you have to have that kind of background to be m more knowledgeable. So the distinction is that outsiders often display a naive realism where their view of reality is the reality, not the interpretation. They don't realize that there's different ways to interpret and they often ignore or discount insider subjective reports of well-being. And we see that time and time again, so many positive reports of well-being, and they say, well, this research must be wrong. <laughs> How can anybody with a disability be that doing so well? So, but it's part of this outsider distinction. So the implications is that um, generally professionals and lay people should trust insiders' accounts. The second is they should withhold judgment about a disability and give credence to the insider. And the last is they should not project their beliefs onto the person, uh, the experience of insiders. So the third principle, adjustment to disability, three key terms. Uh, this is a process where people with acquired disabilities understand how psychological and physical changes are gradually integ integrated into identities, body images, and daily life. That's the process. Adjustment is a state that occurs when a person is satisfied with and accepting of their own person environment relationship. And, um, and then the acceptance, the idea of acceptance, uh, rights idea, the third process, occurs when a disability does not reduce a person's sense of self-worth, uh, nor their future outlook. <clears throat> and typically, it's meant to be a realistic appraisal of the person's situation and may be accompanied by positive efforts and attention to personal assets, strengths. So uh, the idea of promoting psychosocial adjustment, adjustment um, is depending on making constructive changes to both the social environment and the physical environment. It's not just about helping your client, it's also about doing something about the environment. Are you on a board that actually helps with curb cuts? Are you, you know, are you constructively trying to do something that you've brought somebody with a disability onto the board of the organization? That's a proactive inclusion. And so you can see in the Linnean terms the idea is to adjust the client's life space, not just, just the client. Uh, some of the last terms, so no matter how severe, this is again a uh, writing in principle, no matter how severe the disability might be, every person with a disability is assumed to either possess or have the opportunity to develop some asset or assets, and assets entail a, entail a broad array, and these are, they can be tangible, achieved, oops, imagined, learned, personality related, personal qualities, and they can promote resilience, and these are some asset categories. Family and education, work, career, social support, finances and income, 
personality, the big five factors, these can be assets, spirituality, recreation, and then potentially other assets that we don't identify here. So um, assets focus on what something that can actually be done by the person with disability. They signal future opportunities and they uh, focus on uh, what needs to be on, uh, uh, needs to be on what can be done rather than um, relearned or acquired, not what's lost uh, and what can't be retrieved. Last uh, principle, um, self-perception and bodily states. This goes to the heart of a lot of pain rehabilitation in terms of what words do you use to characterize your experience. So the point is, is that subjective perceptions often influence, even determine how we think, feel, and behave. And our view of reality or others is not um, veridical. Our perceptions are tempered, even biased by expectations, stereotypes, and past experiences. Um, examples, um, pain and fatigue are based on perceptions as well as sensations. Their influence are, alt are, are altered by attitude, expectation, and environmental factors, hence a lot of work in pain behavioral, behavioral pain programs. And changing these uh, attitudes, expectations can then alter perception. Last point is uh, human dignity, where we started from. And this is her third point. Um, okay. Now I want to move to the foundational principles. I think I'm doing well with time. I have 25 minutes, fantastic, because that gives me, it gets me off the podium quicker. And it gets us to the, um, but so these are the, uh, the six foundational principles and you have a handout uh, with those principles that we're gonna talk about. This is what we talked about, but I wanted to show you, this is Beatrice in action. Um, I think I just, can I control it here? <laughs> um, how do I turn on the, here, aha, got it, uh-oh. I'm gonna go back one. Christian, can you help me here? So I go here, and then I just hit the, uh, this is an interview, just an introduction. So the book had been published, the 2015 book, and so this is Beatrice, she's uh, 90, 96 here. And um, so, do I need to put sound up? You are the foundation of our field and an inspiration to us all. Dan Rowe, President, Foundation for Rehabilitation Psychology. Oh, my, my, my. <laughs> so thank you. Well, thank you, too. <laughs> thank So that was an inscription in the front of the book uh, that she was supposed to be co-author of. But <laughs> and so this is a satisfied customer. <laughs> with the social psychology of dis disability. So um, to just to recapitulate, we talked about the definition of rehabilitation psychology, um, the origins, we talked about these organizations, the value-laden beliefs and the foundational principles. So I'm gonna uh, uh, be the fastest keynote speaker ever to speak. And, and then I think turn it over at this point. I don't think I have any additional slides. Oh, yes, I do. So this is pretty funny. So we have a yearly mid midwinter meeting, and this is, uh, this is the satisfied customer seeing Mustang Sally uh, in 2003 uh, with a, we have our, have our own band. And so, uh, so Beatrice is there with Mona Carrillo uh, singing Mustang Sally when she was, let's see, I guess she was about 85 uh, at that point. And it was just, I wish I had a video, it's just a still shot. <laughs> but it would be, it really would be, uh, so, so I'm gonna leave it at that, and then uh, open this up for some questions and some discussions, and then um, eventually we're gonna then take a break, and then we're gonna come back and talk about the foundational principles. Dan, you wanted to know 
Right. So to just give you a, a, a little bit of background as we eventually merge into this group discussion is that in uh, February, uh, I was in um, um, Orlando, Florida, where we had our midwinter meeting, and we had a similar size group uh, of rehabilitation psychologists. It was at the, at the midwinter meeting. And so we put the foundational principles up, and um, um, some of you hopefully maybe read that advanced paper that I sent you that talked about the foundational principles. But we taught, so those have been out since 2016, so they've been out for a couple of years. And so we brought many leaders to the field together to say, are these, do these sound right? Have we captured all? And one of the things that's not included in the six principles is the idea of advocacy. So we said, yeah, we really need to revise and add advocacy either as a seventh principle or to work it into the wording of one of the six existing principles. But I'd hope they have a similar kind of discussion about kind of broad questions about any reactions to your knowledge about the field of rehabilitation psychology. And I, I think we'll just focus on my keynote right now, and then we'll get into the foundational principles later. So we don't have to necessarily record this right now. But let me stick with just the presentation and, um, and any questions or comments. There, Lucy, you had a comment. Does peer support come under rehabilitation psychology and have a place there? So there's nothing formally written within the division. The div if anything that you'll, you'll see certainly writings about how to try to go about incorporating peer support and its relevance. So, but from a professional standpoint, there's no position on it in terms of Division 22. But you'll see certainly research and psychologists who actively have included um, peers within, but clearly that's part of the all important environment from Lewinian perspective. The issue is it's a function not just of the person, but also of the environment. And the more you can have an environment that's conducive, supportive to the individual who's newly injured, the better. So it's clearly in accord with those principles. But there's really nothing specific to Division 22 or the American Board of Rehabilitation Psychology that focuses on peer support, per se. Some other, yeah, OK. Thanks a lot. I just have an understanding or a question for understanding. Uh, to be member of the APA board, you have to have a PhD as a psychologist, or you have to have a special training. But per perhaps I didn't got the right definition whether to be a board member or whether to have the um, certificate of rehabilitation psychologist. And I think it's a great work to describe it really as a subspecialist. Let's see if I can back to Because then you also can show that the quality of psychological interventions are really proved in a certain way. Yeah, so the criteria are that you have a PhD from a uh, American Psychological Associated uh, accredited pr training program. And uh, then you have to have an internship, three years of experience, two of which must be supervised. So you can see it's a PhD degree plus three years yeah. uh, of further training. And the PhD is really uh, the same certificate as we have three years of uh, studying and doing research and publishing three papers, or is it a different definition? So it's an undergraduate degree for four years. And then you go to graduate school, typically for five years. And most PhD, well, there's PhD and PsyD programs. So a PhD program is really focused on both research and intervention. A PsyD is focused primarily on intervention. So those programs can vary uh, between PhD and PsyD. But then, th then you have to add, in addition to that, a total of three years super, uh, of experience. So um, the, you know, the, uh, the amount of training is huge. Mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, the training experience. Hence, we only have 200 at the present time. <laughs> Another question? Yes. Or comment? Yes. Um, 
how the whole process works. I mean, I, I can speak only for clinical psychologists, but the counseling psychologists basically have the same uh, requirements. And so it's, it's quite different from how it works, I think, from how I understand how it works here in Germany, where essentially you do your degree and then you do all the training afterwards, right? It's very different in the US. You be, if you're admitted to a PhD program, uh, you're already required to have certain sets of um, uh, preparation in terms of coursework as an undergrad, and then while you're doing the PhD, it requires clinical experience, supervised experience, alongside doing a PhD. Right. So you have three years of coursework plus externships, or if there's a clinic within the university, you gain experience there, and you might do externships in the area that you want to specialize in, and then uh, you have to have acquired a certain number of clinical hours, I forget <laughs> how many there are. 1,500. 1,500 uh, in order to apply for an internship, which is basically one year of full-time clinical work in whichever setting um, you want to work in, like inpatient, rehabilitation unit, et cetera. And then things are not over yet. <laughs> you have to pass a licensing exam and you have to have at least one year of supervised experience as a postdoc, as part of and then if you want to do rehabilitation <laughs> specialization, the work still isn't over. So it's a pretty It's usually a post postdoc. <laughs> the, the model of training is now you get your PhD and you do two years postdoc, one or two years postdoc. Just anecdotally, I was actually, I, I was offered a place to do uh, a doctorate in clinical psychology at Royal Holloway. And when, and so I had to choose. And when I shared my decision, with some friends that say, are you crazy? You could have uh, the doctorate in three years, uh, you know, no worries about anything, but I decided to do it in the US. Anyway, but it's a lengthy process, that, that for sure. Very much. Is there anything similar to it in terms of training in Europe, in terms of focused on rehabilitation? It, it's more, I guess, internships and placements as opposed to a formal course of study and specific competencies that have to be made or achieved. There, there are sp uh, special programs also in Switzerland and you ha can uh, attend a PhD, that's what some of you are doing in the field of psychology, and then you have to have a master of psychology in advance, so a bachelor and a master, and then doing a then PhD, PhD. So, so you are yeah. also finally at seven, eight years. Um, and then when you're going for clinical work, you have to have, or you can achieve a psychotherapeutic title, and this uh, might be cognitive behavior therapy uh, or, or uh, um, analytic or psychodynamics, and then you are a specialized therapist. So there is a, I think there are also uh, kinds of formal training. But it's a different model. <coughs> yeah, it's a, it's a different model. Right. And the challenge is that uh, the psychologists in Switzerland couldn't agree for a similar board ac accreditation, mm -hmm. and therefore they never have the chance to be adequate to the m physicians. But it's not why th that the physicians don't only want. Uh, uh, there's also a part of so, but, right. but that's changing because. But, but they have to get their act together. Yeah, they ha they first. haven't got a, a, the same accreditation, and therefore right. there is a really challenge. And I think this is also a long process. But yeah. you were forced to bring up a same uh, certification program to be really in a health system. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, so in the UK, we have a similar um, PhD, clinical psychology internship, you know, experience, in, but we don't have, which I think is, is what you're saying is the kind of additional two years rehab psychology S specific training in addition to the doctorate, but um, that might be a way to go, Dan, <laughs> um, because we... Um, we have the, in terms of the British Psychological Society, um, the um, division of clinical psychology and a separate division of, of health. Um, who, and as a as a somebody who is adhering to rehab psych, you are a member of both. And if you want to practice neuro, neuro you're also a member of the division of neuro. But there's nothing overarching 
but then most clinical psychologists are the division of clinical psychology and then subdivision faculty of clinical health so that might be a way of but that's the but in terms of identity rehab psych right. is the way to go yeah. when when persons go and the interesting thing so i <coughs> i was one of 10 persons who helped start the american board of rehabilitation psychology in 1995 and so it we sat down and we said, what are the critical competencies that make us different than other psychologists? And so we, it was fascinating discussion because these are people, brain injury, spinal cord injury, a lot of different disability groups they you know, were connected to. And so it was really uh, quite, um, um, in some respects, therapeutic. Because as you work as a rehabilitation psychologist, it's very difficult to know what your identity is because your identity has come from your training program, but those, that identity in terms of working with persons with disabilities, oftentimes it just doesn't fit. Because we work with normal people, for the most part, who find themselves in abnormal circumstances. They have a lot of distress, they have a lot of issues, but it's very different than somebody with a mental health problem coming to you with an identified mental health problem. So we have to be a master of many, many areas uh, from substance abuse to sexual health issues to employment to relationships to attitudes towards disabilities what training program so when we sat down and put together the american board of rehabilitation psychology we really had to think through what are all the different kind of competencies and it was really um, in some respects empowering but then it's like how can you make this really workable the other big issue was the the, in, the interface with neuropsychology. So neuropsychology as a board and as a glamorous thing that everybody wants to study neurosciences and it's just so amazing. So it's, you know, it's, it, it, it was the hot and they were, they, and they existed as a board before we did. So what happened was that, uh, well, there was a little bit of interesting politics that you might find of interest. So in 1995, we, we we declared this board and we made our, we structured our board to meet the criteria for the American Board of Professional Psychology, but we were not affiliated with them. We were our own board, our own legal board, we had our own documents, but we structured it. If they didn't want us, we didn't necessarily want them. We'll go our own way and we will board certified rehabilitation psychologists. And it's like, I think you'd rather have us inside your house so, rather than having us outside your house because we've done everything, but the critical issue is neuropsychology, they really didn't want us in there. So politically, they had a fair amount of oomph because they were an established board with many, many members. But the issue is that you know, the competency that we have, we don't call it neuropsychological assessment, we call it cognitive assessment. And that was done for strategic reasons. We don't do diagnostic neuropsychological assessment, but we do do assessment in which we describe what the problems are, what the deficiencies are. We're not trying to figure out where the problem is in the brain. So I'm, um, I'm somewhat famous for canning the phrase um, when people say, what's the difference between neuropsychology and rehabilitation psychology? I frequently say, well, neuropsychology is the what and rehabilitation psychology is now what? What do you, or sometimes when I've had one glass of wine in me, I'll say neuropsychology is the so what. Because <laughs> the real issue is the data oftentimes do not inform what you want to do with a patient with a brain injury. It's so much, con you know, that person environment interface, the environment is so determinant of what behaviors are going to happen, how well their memory does function. It's amazing their memory's functioning. The test would tell you it won't. But with the right prompts, with the right structure, it's amazing the stuff that people can do. So, um, and you'll talk to neuropsych neuropsychologists who work in brain injury rehab, and eventually they just kind of, they, they don't pay attention or value their testing very much. They really don't. And so, because the practical interventions are less guided by what's on the test results and much more guided by what behaviors they see, what they can shape, what the relationships are, uh, what's the emotional status of the patient and their family? So, that, but so that's the, the uh, a bit of the background. And so, what happened was that we were able to work around that 
you know, kind of uh, giant gorilla in the, in the room in terms of us not being accepted by the American Board of Professional Psychology. But because of the values of ABRP, it really changed the parent organization because we very much be, were, were applicant-centered. So none of the boards did you get a mentor assigned to you. But we, when you want to apply for this board, we'd say, we'd like you to have a mentor. Like, oh my gosh, a mentor, yep, this person will be with you, will walk you through the process with, you know, so we were very much a psychology-centric, it's the same values working with, you know, so we were the first to introduce the idea of a, 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 a that you assign mentor, and we made very transparent exactly what would happen. There was no, you know, the other boards, well, you know, there's kind of the, we don't talk about what goes on in the process. We were totally transparent about the process. So it really, then what happened, other boards started, oh yeah, we have mentors, yeah, where would that come from? Well, that was from the American <laughs> Board of Rehabilitation Psychology. So, but there are a lot of changes that occurred in ABAP because we poured it, the values of rehabilitation psychologists into how we treated applicants for, you know, for our boarding. So it's really been a, a delightful process to see and very much respected uh, and rehabilitation psychology within the American Psychological Association is very respected. Where we talk about being a very little division, it's 150,000 members of the American Psychological Association, and there's 1,100 of us. But we're on council, and when we talk, they listen because they, un they understand that we have this kind of, I think, insider perspective that we can you know, help to understand and translate the. Um, the, the big issue that I've always faced, and I was on council for six years, is that I've always promoted that disability is part of diversity. Disability is diversity. And in the States, disability or diversity is always thought about as a racial construct, as opposed to a, 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 that, you know, a, a disability construct. And so, but it's forever been, they still don't get it. It's those able-bodied that just don't get it. And I think it's the fear, therefore the grace of God go I, and, and they're, you know, we don't think about disability. I really think it's, I think it goes back to a psychodynamic process to tell you the truth. I'm not much of a dynamic psychologist, but, uh, but I, I certainly wonder about the inability of psychologists to get the idea that, that disability is part of diversity and you need to treat it as such you know, from a political standpoint. The other big thing that's happening that I didn't have up, up here, which is very powerful, there's some slides about uh, person-first language. I dropped those out thinking that I wasn't going to talk as fast as I did. But uh, person-first language is uh, the critical issue of talking about the person with a disability and how persons with disabilities want to be spoken about. So Dana Dunn, who is a, just a phenomenal wordsmither and very careful about, just as Beatrice, I think he and Beatrice are so alike. That's the reason I could not get them together. <laughs> Beatrice kind of knew Dana was probably her clone in terms of you know, being so careful about, you know. I, she has a quote. She's, she said, there's uh, the right word and the almost right word. And it's a quote that comes from, um, from uh, Mark Twain and it's the difference between the word lightning versus lightning bug. And so uh, the, the power of words to shape. So Dana is, has an article in the American Psychologist called Person or uh, Disability Language. And so the up and coming version of the writing Bible, which is the standards for, um, for writing uh, the American Psychological Association publication manual is going to, they're talking with Dana Dunn about how do we put into our writing style to recognize the power of language and how persons who are writing about persons with disabilities, how you frame that in your, and so it's gonna become a standard. And that, you know, that's how um, happy we are to have such a gifted person as Dana who thinks about this carefully and the power of language. But it's gonna eventually, in the next edition of the American Psychological Association uh, uh, writing manual or standards, it's going to be in there as part of understanding about, no, you can't write this way. So journal editors, when they start seeing um, disability uh, enabling kind of language, will call it out and say, this is not meeting the standards. Uh, so it's, the power of language to shape is going to be very important, and Dana is paying a fantastic, playing a fantastic role 
right at the heart of all publications in psychology. So it's a, a delight to have him. Dan, um, I think a, a few of your colleagues want to add a few things here. Say it again. So, so um, one of the concepts that I really think about when you want to define rehabilitation psychology, to, which I think it's really key, is based on the ICF. And it has to do with functioning. It's how you enable that functioning again. So if you think about a lot of what we do is the relationship, the dynamic relationship of the individual with the environment. Yeah. And functioning is that particular yeah. aspect of it. So I think that's really critical to how, the de how we define our role as psychologists. I'll stop there. That's a great point. Yes, should we? That Dan, one other quick one thing. More question. We're on the topic of language. Yes. My own pet peeve. Not being a clinician, I can't tell you how many times I see articles where they talk about people as patients. They're not patients unless they're directly in hospital or directly right. under care in a session. They're people. And I see that time and time again, and I think this group is a really good group to start advocating for that. That's a great that point. they are people, not patients. In fact, I will mention that to Dana. That's a great point. Can I add to that? There is a wonderful movie. It's a comedian, I think, type one who does uh, a comedy on that. It's very recent. What's it's it called, a, a committee of one? In a comedian a type oh. one with type one diabetes. Oh. And he starts his comedy oh, it's a with comedian saying, with type one diabetes. Yeah, okay, with gotcha. type one diabetes. And he starts his comedy by saying, I'm a diabetic type one. You know, <laughs> and it's, it's brilliant. I can That's his identity. I can relate right. to you. Gotcha. It's really brilliant. You know, and he's then talking about the type twos and, you know, and it's really alluding to all what you just That's said. That's great. Yeah, it's really great. And I think he's touring right now in the US. That's so. great. Thank you. So w you want, should we take a five minute break? People stretch and then we'll reconvene in five minutes, 10 to the hour. Yep, for the whole group. So take a break. Thank you so much. <laughs>